Well, again, great to uh, be with you. Um, we're going to be looking uh, tonight uh, in the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. I think if you received um, a, f- a flyer or information on uh, what we'll be looking at tonight, uh, the title of uh, the lecture or exposition here of Scripture uh, is uh, Why Did God the Son Become Human? Why Did God the Son Become Human? And the subtitle of that, which will be the primary area where we're looking at, is uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18 and the glory of Christ, right? Hebrews 2, 5 to 18, the glory of Christ. I think it would be great to uh, read this first, and then we'll pray, and then we'll begin to uh, look at this passage, set it up in terms of the importance of the question, uh, the context in Hebrews, and the reasons that uh, the author gives us, and because this is God's word, this is what God is teaching us, the reasons why uh, the incarnation took place and what it actually achieves. Right? So let's read. Uh, I will read uh, Hebrews 2, verses 5 to following, and I'll, have, I'll be reading from the uh, New International uh, Version. The author says, uh, It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, from whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but it's Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted now there's a glorious passage of scripture that unpacks for us both who Jesus is and what he has come to do and so we'll address this by asking the question why did God the son become human so let's pray and commit our time to the Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering this evening. We thank you for each one that's here. We thank you for the opportunity to ask this question, which this text addresses so beautifully and powerfully. And we pray that as we do so, as we walk through the scripture, as we expound it, that you would teach us, that your spirit would apply it to our hearts and lives, that we would be led to greater love and adoration and understanding, and that we would leave here people desirous to know our Savior, uh, to obey Him and serve Him and trust Him uh, 
and to see his great name glorified in this city, in this country, and around the world. Be with us as we uh, gather together, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the question, right, why did God the Son become human? I mean, there's no more significant question that can be asked, right? It's at the heart of the gospel. There's two great mysteries. Uh, J.I. Packer once said in his book, Knowing God, that are at the heart of the Christian faith. Right? And these two mysteries and profound truths are linked together, right? He says the doctrine of the Trinity. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, subsisting in one nature from eternity, their work then in bringing about their entire plan, and of course, the second great mystery is the incarnation, right? The second person of the Godhead taking upon flesh, the nature of the incarnation, why he has come, what he has achieved, the rhyme and reason that it has happened, Everything that we have in Scripture is not for no reason, right? Uh, there are reasons for it, and this fact of the incarnation demands our full uh, reflection, meditation, uh, wrestling with. Uh, theology at its best is faith seeking understanding. We take what Scripture says, and we are seeking to understand it, think through it, wrestle with it, and ask, why this, this happened? Why is it necessary? Why did this happen? Uh, was there any other way for salvation to take place? I mean, these are the questions that come from this text and ultimately uh, the nature of the incarnation itself. Back in uh, the 11th century, right, there is a very, very famous uh, theologian, philosopher who actually wrote a book that is famous in church history, St. Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and uh, he wrote a famous book from this very title. In fact, uh, when I entitled this, uh, I didn't just pull it out of midair, right? Uh, I made a few modifications of it. His title of his book was Why Did God Become Man, right? And I changed it to Why Did God the Son, Right, that's more technically precise. It wasn't just God in general, but it was God the Son, the second person of the Godhead who became flesh. Why did he become human? Anselm, his book was a classic of Christian theology. He wrestled with, in a dialogue with a man named, and I don't think you'd want to call your child this, a Bozo. <laughs> how would you like Bozo as a name? Uh, it was Anselm in dialogue form, and that's often how they wrote uh, at this period of time, addressing this question, uh, wrestling with why the incarnation, what did the cross achieve, and from that, he, uh, from Scripture, he presented what was often called today the satisfaction theory of the atonement or theology of the atonement, that the Son of God had to come in order to satisfy God's honor and righteousness uh, so that we may receive salvation, right? So Anselm has been wrestling with this, and even before Anselm, you can go back all the way in the early church. Uh, Athanasius, major church father, also wrote a great book on the incarnation, and he's wrestling with the same issue, the nature of the incarnation, the fact of the incarnation leads us to this very question. Well, when Athan Athanasius asked this, or Anselm asked, why did God become man? Right? This isn't just uh, answered from them abstractly, right? Scripture itself answers this question. And in fact, the text that uh, we read from Hebrews chapter 2 is probably the best place in all of Scripture to answer the question before us. Now, it's not all that could be said, right? Eventually, to answer the question, why did the Son become man? We would have to look at all of Scripture, and especially all of the New Testament. But in a succinct, short number of verses, from 5 to 18, we do have four reasons that the Son of God became man that is crucial to then answering this question before us, and that's why we want to turn to this passage. I mentioned Anselm, and then I mentioned Athanasius. Uh, 
But more importantly, we want to turn to Scripture, and I think Scripture's answer will confirm many of the things that Anselm would have said. Yet Scripture's answer, I think, is far richer. It is uh, more profound, obviously, because it's Scripture, that even our theological reflection always has to keep going back to the Word of God, and that is why we want to look at this particular passage. Now, as we approach Hebrews 2, 5 through 18, as you study Scripture, you know this very well, you have to place this in terms of its context in the book, right? And uh, as we begin in verse 5, you get the sense that uh, we're not just beginning brand new, it's part of a larger argument that the author has been making. Uh, The author of Hebrews, we don't know who this actually is, Uh, uh, he certainly is, is guided by the Spirit and inspired by the Spirit. He's an unknown author, right? Uh, That is not a problem. Uh, Yet he is the one who writes probably to Jewish Christians. That's probably our best guess given the content of the book. Uh, The book is just full of references to the Old Testament, arguing that Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, that he is the Messiah, that he is the one that the Old Testament prophets have looked forward to. So this whole book is devoted to, really, the exposition of the Old Testament displaying the supremacy and glory of Christ, how he is that to which everything has been moving. And that is why even in the opening verses of chapter 1, the author begins in a way that is unlike most letters. He begins simply by uh, going right into his presentation, laying out a kind of thesis that he then unpacks through the entire book. In the past, God spoke to the prophets, to our, for- through, to our forefathers, through the prophets, in diverse and many ways. Yet, that diverse revelation, in some sense fragmentary, anticipatory revelation, has now come to pass in these last days in Son, right? The Son of God. And by laying this out and describing already in these opening verses something of the glory of Christ, he is making his overall argument that Christ is better Christ is greater, that everything that's come in the past has pointed forward to him, and then through a series of comparison and contrasts, right, he then walks through to encourage these Christians to press on, to warn them not to compromise and, you know, go back in their commitment to Christ, which Seemingly, as you read the book, they were tempted to do. So through a series of comparison and contrasts, uh, he begins to say Christ is better. Right? And he begins the first contrast, and this is where our text is in the middle of it. He begins our first contrast in chapter 1, verse 4. In these opening verses, verses 1 to 3, he lays out the thesis, Christ is better He is the Lord, creator, sustainer, the one who sits down at God's right hand, and then he begins a contrast. So, chapter 1, verse 4, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now, chapter 2, verses 5 to 18, is set within that comparison of Christ to angels. And we could spend a lot of time, I think, trying to wrestle with why does he compare him to angels? I think the simple reason is there's probably many points and facets in application, but angels, if you look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, seem to be tied to the giving of the old covenant. And he's really wrestling with and driving home the point that Christ has brought a new covenant. He's better than the old, and that's probably why he's doing that. There may be other reasons as well. But regardless, he is setting Christ as utterly different than angelic beings, And in chapter 1, which we won't look at, starting in verse 4 all the way through verse 14, there's text after text after text that's quoted from the Old Testament, beginning with Psalm 2, and then the Davidic covenant promise in 2 Samuel 7, 14, Deuteronomy, Psalm 104, Psalm 45, and so on, and then uniquely Psalm 110, which 
has a very, very important role in the entire book, which in fact is uh, the most quoted psalm in the entire New Testament, which our Lord himself appealed to as he spoke to the religious leaders. So I mean this very, very important passage through a series of using texts he speaks of Christ as better than angels in who he is. That's probably the best way of understanding verses 4 through 14. And if we were to walk through that, he would say Christ is better than angels because he has a greater name. Angels aren't the Son. They're not related to the Father. They're not eternal Son. He has the greater name. And then he speaks of him having uh, the worship that only God receives. And you see that in verses 6 and 7. Uh, in verse 8, uh, the Son has the throne of God and the rule of God. That's not true of any angel. And then he speaks of him as creator in verse 10. And the one who rules over all things. Angels are ministering servants. God, the Son, is the ruler. He puts all things under his feet. So those are ways that he, I think, unpacks for you. If we were to speak of Christ in terms of his person and work, who he is, what he does, the primary emphasis in chapter 1 is on who the Son is. So that as he lays out this contrast, the Son is greater in all of these ways because he is God the Son. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, he turns to warning. In this whole book, you know, people have sometimes trouble classifying it. Is it a straight letter? Uh, is it a sermon? Well, it's both. Right? Uh, it, it doesn't fit all the categories of letter, but near the end it does. But it's very much a sermon, very much an exposition. And in sermons, right, Scripture is expounded and then driven home. Right? And much of these warning passages are driving home the message that's just been given. Christ has a greater name. He has a greater rule. He has a greater kingdom. Well, if that's the case, he's the eternal son, creator and Lord of the universe, then you better pay attention to him, right? You better heed his word. You better not wander from him. And that's why in chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, he warns them, we must pay more careful attention to what we've heard so that we do not drift away, right? For if the message spoken by angels, and there's a reference to angels, right? If the message spoken by angels was binding, it's probably a reference to the Old Covenant. Every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation, right? So the encouragements to press on are because of who Jesus is. The warnings to not depart are because of who Jesus is, right? They're two sides of the same coin. And he's driving that message home. Christ is greater, but then in verse 5, which is our text, just sort of setting the context here, he continues, right? And you know he continues with that in mind because in verse 5, it's not to angels, right? So you know his argument is being picked up again, right? So after warning, he now turns back. And I do think the emphasis in verses 5 through 18 uh, advances the comparison and contrasting that he's doing with the angels, right? Obviously, it's impossible to separate the, who Jesus is from his work. But I do think the primary emphasis on verses 5 through 18 is on his work. Right? So that in his argument here, Christ is better than angels because of who he is, and then in verse 5, because of what he does. Right? And it basically goes like this. The Son of God right, can do a work he is better than angels because he can do a work that no angel could ever do, right? So he's better, chapter 1, because of who he is. But in chapter 2, he's better because he does a work that no angel can do. And we could even add to this, no Old Testament figure could do. Well, he'll go on to speak about Moses and priests and everything else. But at this point here, ultimately, it's going to be only the Son of God who has become flesh can do this work. Nobody can do it. No angel can do it. No angel can bring, as he says here, the world to come. Now, what is the world to come? Right? Well, 
He's already mentioned this, I think, previously. So he says in verse 5, it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. Now, where has he been speaking about that? Well, in chapter 1. Now he's just falling on the heels here. Well, let's put chapter 1 and say. Again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, right? So there's already been mentioning this. What does world to come mean? Well, world to come is an Old Testament term, right? An Old Testament idea that's found in the prophets, right? World to come, if we could sort of summarize the idea, would be the prophets as they look forward, they look forward to ultimately a future age. Right? They look forward to a future age as they build off the Old Testament revelation that will bring all of God's promises and purposes to pass. They describe this future age in a whole host of ways. In the future, think of Isaiah 65, the world to come, the age to come will be a new creation. In the future, uh, in the world to come, in the age to come, the dawning of a better and greater covenant. And so they speak of new creation, new covenant. In the future, the reign of God will break into this world in such a way that the Lord and ultimately the King will put all of the enemies under His feet and, and salvation will come in the promised sense that goes all the way back to a Genesis 3.15. Sin will be destroyed. Judgment will come. I mean, all of these ways. And then it's spoken of in terms of the coming of the Spirit, a resurrection age, Daniel 12, a whole host of ways. The new age will bring new hearts. That's Ezekiel 36 and a whole host of things that are tied to the world to come. And with that, and of course, he's already in chapter 1 been quoting from Davidic passages and Messianic passages. This is already in his mind where he is then saying, as he works through this passage, Christ is greater than angels because he is able to bring the world to come. Christ is better than angels because he can bring God's salvation reign to this world that no angel could ever bring. Christ is greater than angels because he can bring the new creation, the new covenant, and he can pour out the Spirit, and he can bring the forgiveness of sins at the heart of the new covenant promise in Jeremiah 31. And the author will later expand this in chapter 8 to 9 and 10. At the heart of the new covenant is, God says, for I will forgive their sins. I will remember them no more, right? put in the context of the Old Testament where the Old Covenant through sacrificial system and repetition and priest there was a remembrance of sin over and over and over again the New Covenant promise looks to a day when there will be a total forgiveness of sin well that's what is meant here by the world to come and so this verse 5 is a crucial transition verse that then unpacks and gives reasons why the Son of God God had to come the son of God out of necessity and this language of necessity will be found as you walk through the text in fact in verses 14 you have the sense there since children have flesh and blood he too shared uh, verse uh, 17 for this reason he had to be made like this is the language of necessity apart from the son of God coming Apart from the Son of God taking on humanity, apart from the Son of God, and he'll flesh it out in terms of death and priestly work, no world to come, no salvation, no judgment. That's what he ultimately is laying out for us. And in fact, as I mentioned just as we were passing by, there are four main reasons that the author gives us here of why the Son became human, right? The first, and it's all bound up with verse 5 in his argument here. The first reason we see in verses 5 through uh, 9 is that the Son of God became human, something no angel could ever do to undo the work of Adam and to usher in the world to come, or we'll simply say here, because we're thinking of Adam, the new creation. Right? The first reason will be to undo the work of Adam and to usher in a new creation. That's why the Son has become human. And only he 
can do this. Right? The second reason, and all of these reasons are ultimately interlocked. Right? And they're interlocked because Psalm 8, as we'll see just in a moment, is what frames the entire argument. Right? And we'll come back to that. But the second point that we'll be looking at from verses 10 through 13 is that the Son of God became human, not only to undo the work of Adam, bring in a new creation, but in verses 10 to 13, to bring many sons to glory. And there's the not only adoption theme, but we'll see what sonship is said in this context. And then thirdly, the Son of God became human in order to destroy the power of death and the devil. And that's found in verses 14 to 16. No angel can destroy the power of death. No angel can destroy the devil. Only the Son of God becoming human can do that. And then you have in the last area, uh, which is really, and in some sense, Psalm 8, will say, frames the entire sort of argument here. And it's culminating in the priestly work of Christ. Right? And so you have then in verses 17 to 18, the Son of God became human to become a merciful and faithful high priest. Right? So that will be the argument that the author gives, working through some texts, particularly Psalm 8, right? arguing that the Son of God is better, and in this case here, better than angels, but we could also then say better than anyone, right? because the Son of God has become human to restore us, right? to bring us to glory, uh, to defeat the power of death and the devil, and to be a faithful and merciful high priest. These are all reasons why the incarnation has taken place. It hasn't happened just simply because the Son of God wanted to sort of figure out what life on earth is all about. He came to do a work, and that work is absolutely necessary, and apart from that work, we have no hope. That's the argument that's given. All right, let's look now at verses 5 through 9. Right. Why did the God, God the Son become human? To fulfill, right, to undo the work of Adam, to usher in a new creation. We could even say here to fulfill God's original intention for humanity. Right? The author resumes, as we said, his argument. Right? We've looked at that in terms of verse 5, a kind of transition. He says, it's not to angels that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, right? And then he quotes from a very, very important psalm from Psalm 8. Now, the author of Hebrews uh, has a great way of quoting Old Testament texts, right? I don't know if this provides justification for losing your memory sometimes of where those texts were actually found, but it's almost like he's saying, right? Somewhere someone said something, right? And then he quotes Psalm 8, right? So, I don't know. But it's very, very important that he frames Psalm 8 here, right? And then you have the quotation from a few verses of Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You put everything under his feet, right? So as the author does often in this book, in fact, most New Testament authors, when they quote the Old Testament, right? Well, they never quote it randomly. Right? They just don't pick it out. To, uh, here's my verse picked out by a hat here. Uh, you know, um, and just let's put this verse down. They're carefully, carefully thinking through the Old Testament, thinking through what these passages are saying in context, right? They can't lay that all out for you, but they assume that you know something of the Bible storyline, they assume that you know where these texts are in the Old Testament revelation, and then they begin to draw their arguments very, very carefully, right? The more you study God's words, you appreciate how, uh, under inspiration, these authors so carefully handled the Bible, right? Psalm 8, in its original context, right? Or Psalm 8 in the Old Testament is a psalm which in some sense forces you to look backward and forward, right? Backward to creation, 
forward ultimately to what he then says is fulfillment in Christ, right? Psalm 8, if you go back in your Bibles to this psalm, it's a creation psalm, right? So Psalm 8 is a psalm that when we say goes back, goes back to, in some sense, Genesis 1 and 2, right? So the author begins, David's the author, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you've ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your hands, the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, now you have where Hebrews picks it up. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honor. You made him a ruler over the works of the sea, uh, over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. And that's where this quotation ends in Hebrews 2. But he says, all flocks and herds, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, the swim in the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, right? Well, when you read Psalm 8, right, you can flip back to Hebrews 2. But when you read Psalm 8, it forces you backwards, doesn't it? It forces you backwards to creation. It forces you back to remind yourself of This creation psalm, as David reflects upon that, he's amazed that the God of heaven and earth, who's made everything, has made you and I, of course, that begins in Adam, such wonderful, glorious creatures, right? We often forget that. I mean, there's a lesson even here for our lives, right? You and I, as Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 lay out in the early chapters, in the early chapters, you and I are created in the image of God, right? You and I were created different than any other created thing, right? As you work through the creation account, which we won't do that, there's a clear distinction that even though all that God creates is creation and we're part of that, yet we're not like the animals. We are created as image bearers. And what is our task in creation? Well, Psalm 8 lays it out there, isn't it? We are to rule, right? We often speak of image bearing as we like to say that we are God's sort of vice regents or we are kings and queens, right? Well, that's what it is. We are presented in royal terms. We are those who are made in Adam to rule over all things. And what does that mean? Well, he placed us in a garden, Adam in a garden. He was to expand the borders of that garden to the end of most parts of the earth. He was to work and to rule over creation and to farm and to do science and do all of these things to God's glory. And the Bible will speak of that as putting everything under our feet, right? So having dominion over, dominion instead of stewardship and rule. And then, of course, you have the creation of marriage and all of these issues. I mean, truly, as David reflects On the glory of God, he's reminded that he made you and I with such dignity, right? We live in a day and age where as Christian view of the world departs, right? What often happens? Well, obviously, you first lose God. But the Bible will also say that when you lose God, you lose yourself, right? You'll never understand who you are, right? John Calvin, the famous uh, reformer, began his institutes by saying the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the self are totally related, right? In the sense that you will never know yourself until you first know the God who made you and the purpose of your creation. And that's what David is celebrating, right? So this text in Psalm 8 drives us back. David is celebrating our role in creation, right? And the value that we have. But there's a problem, isn't there? (laughs) Psalm 8, I mean, there's a few hints in there about having victory over enemies and this type of thing. But for the most most part, Psalm 8 is pretty optimistic, isn't it? Oh, Lord, our Lord, right? You made us this way to rule over. Now, the cynics in us, right? Uh, would say, David, David, right? Uh, I know that maybe God made us rule that way originally, but, you know, we've done a pretty bad job of it, right? Uh, We haven't really put everything under our feet. Uh, What about Genesis 3, David, right? I mean, it's almost as if Psalm 8 celebrates what we were made in Genesis 1 and 2, but what about Genesis 3? 
I mean, where's the sort of balance here? Is David sort of this kind of uh, naive optimist that doesn't understand what's uh, going on in the world and everything else? Well, no, 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 that's not it, right? Psalm 8, right? Yes, looks back. But it also now in its position in the Old Testament, right? So Psalm 8 is written by David many years after the fall, right? David knows full well that sin has entered this world, that you and I don't put everything under our feet. In fact, ultimately, I always like to say that uh, uh, eventually we live long enough and if the Lord doesn't return, the earth eventually seems to win because it puts us under its feet, right? So that there is a sense, right, by Genesis 3 that this original purpose for us is gone, right? It's lost. But Psalm 8 not only looks back, but it ultimately looks in prophetic hope forward. Well, how does it do that, right? Well, how it does that is, of course, it picks up. So as I said, these texts aren't just picked randomly out. Psalm 8 is embedded in the entire storyline of the Old Testament that remembers creation, knows of the fall, but also knows of, say, a Genesis 3.15. Well, what's a Genesis 3.15? Well, that's the promise that there will eventually come a human. Well, how's that? Well, it's the seed of the woman. Eventually will come from the human race one who will crush the serpent's head, right? There will come from the human race, one who, and of course in the context of Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you have to read the initial promise that is not precise, it's not given great definitions, but it's clear enough that God as he promises to Adam and Eve that he will send one from them, human, who will reverse the effects of what's just happened, right? There is hope from Genesis 3.15 on that builds through the Old Testament, through covenant after covenant, promise after promise, that the creation will be restored, that the original purposes for this world will not remain in terms of death and, and sin and death will not have their last word, but there will come a world to come, right? This is what he's already picked up in verse five, an age to come when God will bring the purposes of Genesis one and two for the human race back, right? That he will not leave us in this state. And this has been going on in the entire promises of God. Psalm eight looks back to the original creation, it also looks forward in light of the fall to the restoration. And in the Old Testament, that's precisely how this psalm begins to function. So we would say, as the New Testament says of David, David speaks prophetically. How does he speak prophetically? He speaks prophetically by giving hope, not as a naive optimist of everything will be fine, don't worry about it. He says, no, in the future, right? Right? The purposes of creation will be restored. Us, our role in creation will not be lost. And that's part of the entire promised plan of God that's been going on since the fall, right? And Psalm 8, position where it is in the Old Testament, reminds you of that. In fact, that is precisely how the author of Hebrews reads this psalm, right? So he says, as we said in verse 5, Angels don't bring the world to come, right? This Old Testament sense of the new order, the new world. Angels don't bring that. And then he's reminding them ultimately that Christ is the one who brings that. But he says, look, we were made. There's a place where someone has testified. And then he quotes Psalm 8, pushing us back to creation. In some sense, this is why I say, uh, even though Adam's name is not mentioned, uh, Christ is the one who will undo the work of the first man, right? That's what Psalm 8 is, is assuming in Adam. It's assuming that there will be a future where the old will be restored. And notice where he finishes in verse 8 in, in Hebrews 2. After quoting from Psalm 8, he'll put everything under his feet. Commentary begins. And notice how the author makes this commentary, how he moves from the Old Testament passage, which gives prophetic hope, 
to then how it now is being fulfilled in Christ, right? So here's his commentary. He says, you got that Psalm 8 in mind, putting it in terms of the Old Testament. He then says, in putting everything under him. Now, it's very important to get the hymn right here. I think most people, when you read this, right, especially most Christian readers, uh, often first think, well, the hymn is Jesus. But I don't think that's correct, right? It's not doing justice, right? It's reading from Psalm 8. Who is the hymn? The hymn is the hymn of Psalm 8, right? Well, who's that? Well, first, that's Adam. <laughs> Ultimately, it's us that come from Adam. The image bears the human race, right? So in putting everything under, so I'll put in terms of him, Adam. Or putting everything under the human race, right? God's purpose for us was to rule over creation. In putting everything under us, or Adam, the human race, God left nothing that is not subject to Adam or to us. That's the original. That's what <laughs> Psalm 8 reminds you of. But, of course, the author of Hebrews knows of the fall. He knows of death. He knows of the entrance of sin into this world. And then he says, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him. And again, the him is the him of Psalm 8. So what he's saying here in this commentary is he's just basically picking up the storyline of the Old Testament, isn't he? Right? God has put, Psalm 8 says, everything subject to Adam to us. Yet, let's factor in the fall here. That's what the Old Testament does, right? That's the world around us. We don't see things subject to us, right? We don't see things subject to us. We do not rule. We do not reign. We do not carry out the purpose of why we were created in the first place. We've sinned against God. We've violated the covenant. We've done all of these things. And that's why he says, yet at present, we do not see everything subject to Adam to us. Now you have the contrast, right? Now you have. Are you speaking of reading from the sheep? Reading right from here. Oh yeah, you're not speaking from your own mind. Right here. Right no, here. no, you're reading it. Yeah. Can you speak with that? Okay. Verse nine. But, and here we have the contrast, right, right from the scripture here, right. But, we see Jesus, right. So notice the contrast, right. So he begins to say, right. We do not see things subject to us, right? Sin has come into the world. Verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made little lower than the angels. So the contrast here is now showing how Psalm 8 now is being fulfilled, right? How Psalm 8 is now coming to pass. We see Jesus, and how is Psalm 8 now coming to pass? How is God now keeping his promise from Genesis 3.15 that there will be restoration, that sin and death will be removed, that it will be destroyed? How is that happening? Jesus has come. We see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels. What's that a reference to? Well, it's picking up Psalm 8, right? Psalm 8 has the notion of we are made a little lower than the heavenly beings, the angels, but it's referring now to his incarnation. Uh, we see Jesus, the Lord, the angels, right? So this is the son now who's become man, who's become human. We see him. He's now crowned with glory and honor, right? Well, how is he crowned with glory and honor? Well, he's become man because he suffered death. So here we have incarnation to life, to death of Christ, right? So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Now, he's going to go on there in verse 10, but this is the first thing that he's picking up from Psalm 8. Why did the Son come? He has stepped back and see he's got a huge sweep of Scripture emphasizing that it's only in the Son of God, him taking on flesh, him being crowned with glory and honor. Him suffering death, right? There's all of the redemptive work of Christ, incarnation to life, to death, to resurrection. It's only because of that that the world to come comes, that restoration comes, that we are brought back to our purpose of our existence, that our sin is forgiven, that we are restored to our image-bearing role, that we are made more human again in the sense that I like to say that sin dehumanizes us. It destroys the very purpose of our existence. But now the Son has come to save us, to make us more human again, to restore us, to bring a new world, 
And that is why he has come, and no angel can do that, right? No angel can do that. Ultimately, even in the Old Testament Scripture, even though he's a human who does that, no mere human figure can do that. Only the Son can do that who has become incarnate and who has suffered death for us, right? And so that's why I say this is the first reason why the incarnation, to undo the work of Adam, to bring the new creation, to restore us, right? How do we think of the glory of Christ's work and salvation? Often we think of it rightly as making us right with God. That's first, foremost, never diminish that. Yet making us right with God also restores us, right, in relation to Him. And ultimately, because sin has effects upon the entire world, it restores us to what we were made to be in the first place. We were made to be those who rule, and ultimately, in and through Christ alone, because of what he has done, we'll be restored to the very purpose of our creation. That's already beginning now, and it'll be consummated in the end. And this is the first reason that he gives, apart from this Savior, apart from this Redeemer, there is no restoration, there is no salvation, there is no regathering of our image-bearing role, there's no hope outside of him. And that's how this is developed for them. And then verse 10 leaves us to uh, the second reason, but it's ultimately picked, it's interwoven with the first, right? So in some sense, we're dividing it here, yet it's all picking up from Psalm 8 still, right? So that the Son of God became human, in order to undo Adam's work, to bring a new creation, to restore us to our original creation, and also to bring many sons to glory, right? You have this in verses 10 to 13. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God from whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Right? This is, now, in bringing many sons to glory, right? first we have to become clear as to what glory is referring to. Right? Normally, we associate, I think, glory with heaven. But I think before we do that, it's important again to put glory in the context of Psalm 8. Right? Psalm 8 has already mentioned glory. right? So that he says here that he made us crowned with glory. right? Our image-bearing role is crowned with glory. And so the Son in becoming incarnate in going to the cross is restoring us and bringing sons to glory is part of that restoration. Right? So that he's restoring us to what we were made to be. There's just further confirmation of what we've seen in verses 5 through 9. Right? Without the Son of God doing this, we would not be restored. Without the Son of God doing this, we would not be brought back to sonship, back to adoption, back to the role that we have that he's made for us. And notice, even the words here are unfolding this as well. Jesus is described here as the one who is the author of their salvation. Right? The word author in English is very difficult to translate from the Greek. Right? In the original, there's almost two ideas that no English word really fully captures. And so our translations do the best they can and they just simply put author down. Right? But the two ideas really are under this is the first is the idea of author in the sense of the one who is trailblazer right so you have a sense of author right author write something and make something new but the idea trailblazer I mean these are the two ideas what one word in English captures that well uh, author we've settled on and that's why we try to explain say right but these ideas together is picking up the point that the author is, you know, that author of Hebrews is making, is that in Jesus becoming incarnate, he blazes a trail, right? He opens up a door, right? He is the first man in his incarnation of life, death, and resurrection, the first man of the new creation, who opens up the world to come, who by, and then note it says here, perfect through suffering. Through suffering, through death, through his death on the cross and his resurrection, 
he now brings the new world to pass and he now brings sons after him, right? We're almost like following in his wake. He brings us back to glory. We're restored to what we were made to be as image bearers, conformed to the image of Christ, patterned after his glorified humanity because he has come and he's blazed the trail through death, right? And he's been the victor in this. And he's made us, in verse 11, his family, right? That's amazing. Right? So the Son of God, now in taking our humanity, makes us part of the family. And you see this verse 11, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Right? He identifies. This is where we get the sense that Christ is our elder brother. But of course, he's the Lord. Right? But he's the Lord who's the elder brother, who blazes the trail, who is the victor, who brings us as part of the family that ultimately is seen in terms of the new people of God. And Jesus then is not ashamed. The son is not ashamed to call us family, to call us brothers. I mean, that's a precious thought, right? We have to first realize that he has every right to be ashamed. Uh, we are sinners before him, but he has come as obedience to his father's will, uh, love for his father to do uh, what we cannot do to bring us adoption of sons and to bring us back to glory. And these texts that he then quotes from the Old Testament are rich. We won't look at them here, but these again in their context are powerful, powerful texts that are messianic, that speak of God's new work in Christ. The first text that he says in verse 12 comes from Psalm 22. You probably remember Psalm 22. That's the psalm that the Lord Jesus uh, utters on the cross. It begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it ends with triumph. Where God has heard this suffering servant and he has brought a new family to pass. And that is what's being celebrated here and fulfilled in Christ. And then in verse 13, you have two sentences that come from Isaiah 8. And you know in Isaiah 8, Isaiah 8 is embedded in a wonderful messianic section from 7 to 9. The virgin conceived and the coming of Emmanuel and the mighty God, the everlasting Father who sits on David's throne. And out of this, you have this work of Messiah who brings about the family of God. And the, you almost have Christ presented here as the singer, the choir master who sings to the Father praises of the children that he's won. Right? It's a beautiful image. But it then reinforces the point right, of why the Son became human to bring us back, to bring the new creation, to bring us adoption of sons, to restore us the purpose of our creation, to make us part of his family, uh, to ultimately bring the salvation that is described throughout scripture. And then, of course, he then moves even further to in verses 14 to 16 to speak of the Son of God becoming human to destroy death and the devil, right? And of course, all of these are interconnected. Sin leads to death. The devil has power over us because of sin and death. He will mention even something more significant in verses 17 and 18, but hold off there in terms of that. But here we have, since the children, verse 14, have flesh and blood. And notice that. Since we have a humanity, since we are flesh and blood, the Son of God has to share in that humanity. Why does he have to share in it? Because he can't redeem us without sharing it. Uh, he has to share in our humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. It's not angels that he helps. Right? That's an amazing statement, right? Angels aren't image bearers. In Scripture, there's no evidence that fallen angels, there's no evidence of salvation for fallen angels. We know there's not, right? Uh, yet it's not angels that he helps, but he helps Abraham's descendants. The idea of Abraham's descendants, I think, picks up the idea of people of faith, right? People who believe the promise of God who are Abraham's descendants, right? But he pictures this in terms of powers over us. The devil is a tyrant that holds death over us, right? Because we are sinners, we die, Scripture says. The devil is a power over us, and it leads us to fear death. 
Woody Allen. You know, he's an American playwright and not always the best person to quote. But on this, he reminds us, right, uh, why, if you ask the question, why do we fear death so much? He gives us this quip that only Woody Allen can give. He says, it's not that I'm afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Right, so you know that. But we do fear death, right? We fear death for a variety of reasons, but ultimately in Scripture, we fear death because death is ultimately the penalty of sin, right? The wages of sin is death. And we fear death because we know that ultimately death means that we will stand before God, right? We'll stand before a holy God. So the picture here is that sin holds us, death holds us. The devil then holds power over us. We cower in fear. We're powerless. But the Son of God has come to rescue us. He's come to rescue us. We have flesh and blood. He takes on our flesh and blood. The only way that he can destroy death and sin is by dying, which is only possible through taking on our humanity, defeating death and paying for its penalty, and thus the devil's power is gone, right? That's what he's speaking of here. And this is another reason why the Son of God has taken upon our flesh, right? You think of later, later passages in Scripture where we have Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Jesus himself can say, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever. I hold the keys of death and Hades. I have power over it, right? Sort of an ironic twist that we have here, and we know why it's the case, but normally when we think of defeating death, you don't think of death defeating death, right? You think that death is a sign of defeat. But of course, in this death, tied to his payment for sin, He now holds the keys of death and Hades and has all power and authority. He has all resurrection life. And that is why, that is why he has come in order to make all of that possible, right? And then the last reason that we have here in verses 17 and 18 is really in some sense, Psalm 8 frames the entire reason why the Son of God has come to restore us, to bring us back, to undo the work of the first man, to become the first man of the new creation, to bring children to sons, us, believing Abraham's descendants in his wake, to restore us back. But it all culminates in a priestly work, right? It all culminates in one who now becomes man in order to represent, in order to be a substitute, in order to be a great high priest. And in fact, we read of this in verses 17 following. For this reason, right? That little phrase is grounding things. It's moving to conclusion. Everything I've said is is just for this reason, he says. For this reason, he, then notice the, the strong, strong language here. He had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement, but really it's the idea of propitiation. That's the word that's really under it. Atonement is a term that uh, we use in English, but he made propitiation for the sins of the people. And then he draws the comfort because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Here's where it's all going, right? It's all linked together, but ultimately it must culminate why the Son of God has become human is we need a priest, We need a great high priest. Why do we need a great high priest? Well, what's a high priest do? Well, the book of Hebrews will unpack this whole theme in great detail. In fact, in chapter 5, verse 1, you have a very nice short summary of what a priest is. A priest must come from among the people. He must be a representative for those people on behalf of God. And he must deal with the problem of sin. Well, those three areas give you why it is that he must become human. He must, in order to identify with us, he must become one of us. 
in order to represent us. He must take on our humanity. And more than any priest or priest in the Old Testament, in order to ultimately deal with the problem of sin, it's going to require nothing less than the Son of God to lay down his life. Now that becomes different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the priest offered a sacrifice. He offered something even for himself and for others. But not this high priest. That will never do. What he must do is he must identify in order to represent, in order to become a substitute Because even if you look at the previous verses, as terrifying as death may be, as enslaving as the devil's power may be over us, the only reason that death and the devil have any power is first and foremost, we have sinned before God, right? And that is what is getting picked up in these verses here. He had to become like us in every way to become this one who identifies, this one who can represent, this one who can become a substitute, namely a faithful high priest in service to God to make a propitiation for our sins, right? That's the problem, right? So that in order for us to be restored to Psalm 8 kind of status, we need our sins dealt with. We need to be made right with God. We need one to represent us, but ultimately in Scripture, right? this is picked up, I think, in this word propitiation. Propitiation is a very, very important word because it ultimately conveys the point that the problem, the greatest problem that we have is that we are sinners before a holy God. And the holy God cannot just overlook our sin and sort of just wipe it away. No, sin must be paid for in full so that this one who pays for it can represent us because he's human. He can identify with us because he has become flesh, but he must also be the son who is deity. He must also be God the son who must take on flesh because you need both the divine son to satisfy ultimately his own, God's own righteous requirements because we've sinned against him so that he will also now take our place so that he now can become a merciful, faithful high priest and restore us to Psalm 8, to bring sons to glory, to defeat death and the devil, to bring the new world that no angel can bring, And this passage here gives us, step after step, unpacking this great storyline of the Old Testament, why it is that the Son of God came to this world, right? He didn't come to the world to just be a great educator. He didn't come to the world just to understand how human life is like. And in fact, him coming to this world, it's amazing that we have a merciful high priest and a faithful high priest. And we have one who is able to, um, because he suffered, he's able to help those who are being tempted. He understands what we're going through. All of that's true. But ultimately, he became human in order to redeem in order to pay for sin, in order to bring about our justification, in order to accomplish what we could not do, what no angel could do, no what any you know, human figure could do, but only him and him alone, right? And that is why he has come. Now, living in the world that we live in, right, Jesus is viewed by people in many, 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 many different ways, right? But the Jesus of the Bible is viewed in only one way, right? The Jesus of the Bible is the Son of God from eternity. The Jesus of the Bible is the one who has taken on our humanity. He's God the Son incarnate. He is the one who's fully God, fully man. He is the one who is worthy of all of our love and service and devotion. And when you tie that to his work, he is the only one only one now it sits, doesn't sit well in our society but he's the only one that can save he's the only one who meets our need and he meets our need perfectly he is the all-sufficient 
He is the suitable savior. There's no place outside of him that we must turn. We must, though, turn to him and find in him our all in all. And that's a message that we as the church need to hear. It's a message that we must take to our city and the world and our, then the, ultimately the nations. Apart from this Redeemer, apart from the incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection, and all that he has achieved, there is no hope, but in him we have everything. Right? And that is why the Son of God has become human. Now Anselm said something very similar. But I think Scripture said it long before Anselm did. He was reflecting on it. And I think Scripture is much richer, right? Scripture, I mean, you can speak in terms of honor and all that's good, Anselm did. A classic piece of literature. But this is God's word that unpacks for us the beauty of the Redeemer, the glory of his work, that which deserves from us all faith, trust, worship, obedience and service in our life now and forevermore. Right? Well, let's pray. And then I think we have a break, right, of freshments, and uh, we'll take some instruction on that. And then we'll have some Q&A afterwards, right? Is that right, Andy? Okay. 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 Good. Well, let's pray first, and then you want me to pray for the food, and we'll do that kind of thing too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your own dear Son. We thank you that the Son did not remain uh, in eternity past and simply in eternity apart from now taking upon our human nature. That in time and space, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he did so for a reason. He did so uh, not simply for no reason at all, but to restore us to bring about all of your saving plans and purposes, to redeem us from our sins, to make us right with you, to bring us back to our sonship and to glory. And we have in Christ everything we need and we have a glorious future before us. And we pray that these great truths would govern our lives even this night this week, this year, all the days of our life, may we always be those who glory in Christ Jesus, glory in his cross, and seek to live for him, and to honor him, and to glorify him, and to make him known. That is our desire, and we pray that even as we have reflected on this from your word, uh, these great truths tonight, that you will take these truths by your spirit, and glorify your Son in our lives and in the church. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Okay.